Hello and welcome to Tiny Desk Knitting with Emma. Today I'm going to be doing the third and final installment in my Cockalory sweater video series. So um, you can see it's here, it's inside out. Um, I'm going to turn it right side out so you can see it. And then I'm going to give you a quick rundown on what I'm going to be, whoops, pair of scissors, what I'm going to be doing in this video. It's going to be uh, some discussion of stuff and then some demos. So it's not like done done, it's just mostly done. The knitting part is done. I'll show it to you from the back so you can really properly see the yoke. There it is. Lots of colors. Speaking of colors, that is probably the first thing I'm going to discuss here. I'm going to talk about colors in the yoke, how I chose them, um, how they go together, how um, I did the chart to lay them out. I'm going to talk about yoke construction, which includes short rows. Um, in a spot where you may not be familiar with doing short rows, um, there are several places you can do short rows if you're doing a, um, a yoke sweater, top down or bottom up. So I'll discuss the placement of the short rows. Um, quick demo on underarm seams. So one of the ways it's not done is that I've got my stitches still on hold here for my underarm. So I'm gonna seam those up, show you how to do that with Kitchener stitch. Um, and then I'm gonna demo uh, how to do a needle felted steek. I have my needle felting tools here. Here's the foam pad and I'll show you my felting tool in a minute. You can see where I've done other steeks up the middle here before. <laughs> Maybe on this side, no, not really on this side, but you need needle felting tools like this is a giant, very dense foam pad um, to do your needle felting on. Um, that includes uh, not weaving in any ends on the inside. Oh, I'm talking too fast. Um, my mom keeps telling me to slow down. <laughs> Sorry, mom. Uh, one of the things that is great about doing a needle felted steek or any steek, yeah, any cardigan, is that you can change colors in the round, um, like over the steek, in the steek bridge, and then you don't have to weave in those ends. You can leave them, leave them loose, and that's pretty cool. And then you can just cut them out. Um, I usually knot them first to make sure that the stitches don't get all loose. Uh, you cut them, the needle felt the steek, and then just cut it. And you can trim the ends if you want, it's really easy. And there's a bunch of ends you don't have to weave in, which is amazing. You have to weave in all the other ends. And if you're doing like an all over piece or something, you're still gonna have to weave in your ends on your sleeves, but, um, but not in the middle of your body if you're cutting it up the middle. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then I'm gonna do a quick demo for how to pick up button bands. Um, I'm just gonna tell you now, I usually, my method is do the like seek steek securing. So for me, that's always with needle felting tools. Um, get the felting tool out so you can see it. Uh, I secure it. So I cut, trim the ends and I secure the steek. Then I do the button bands. Here's my needle felting tool. I've got three needles on it. Um, then I do the button bands. Uh, like I pick them up and knit them. And then after that, I cut the steek open and tack the um, edges down with a, just some extra yarn and, um, and a darning needle, regular needle for weaving in ends. Okay, um, if you are wondering where the pattern for this sweater is, this stick, yes. I took, uh, I took the like, magnetic wallet off my phone um, because I'm using a tripod and um, and then it's magnetic, so my needle sticks to it. Ha! Ah, cool. Okay. Anyway, um, the pattern is in Fair Isle Weekend by MJ Mucklestone, which was published last year, uh, 2020, by Lina. Um, there's two beautiful samples of this sweater in this book. Um, this one. And then there's one at the beginning. You'll notice that neither of them are... Um, here's the other one. Neither of them are cardigans. Well, this might be a cardigan. Can't tell. This is the back. Mine is inspired more by this one, um, which is a more high contrast yoke. So I did a dark brown with a light brown and then reds, oranges, and yellows inside the yoke. Um, whereas the original is beautiful, low contrast flowers. Oh, so this one's got the both the background and the foreground colors of the yoke changing, which is really also a, a traditional way to do 
Oh, fair amount of work and it's so beautiful. <laughs> but low contrast. I wanted high contrast. It's just my personal preference for this particular sweater. Okay, so before I get into demos, let's talk about colors. Okay, so my, oh, I don't have my cone for the contrast. Oh, well, my main color for the whole sweater is this dark brown. This is Jameson and Smith uh, Supreme Jumperweight or Jumperweight Supreme uh, in 2005, which is Shetland Black undyed natural yarn. This came off a cone, which is why there's some debris in it, some hay. I think that's one of the best parts about knitting with like less processed wool. You really feel more connected to the animal that this came from, especially it's not even dyed. Um, so I love that. You can buy cones directly from the manufacturer, Jameson and Smith in Shetland. They'll ship to you. I do that sometimes. I buy them in natural colors. I don't buy the, I don't buy a lot of them in the dyed colors, but if I'm using a lot, I do. I also used a cone for the, of the same yarn for the background color of the yoke, which is 2006 Gamel Goat, Gamel Goat. Um, also great. Don't have it with me. It's not in this bag, um, but it's somewhere else. <laughs> and then my yoke colors. Did five, yeah, five, one, two, three, four, and... yeah, five. Okay, so got from outside to inside and then back out. They are symmetric, it is they, it, the yoke is symmetrical. Cardinal, these are all Jameson's Shetland Spindrift. Uh, in case you're wondering, Cardinal, Paprika. Burnt Umber, which is kind of an orangey. Burnt Umber, yellow. Ah. And then the middle is called Autumn. And this is also yellowy, but there's some green and reddish and pinkish bits in it. So I thought that would be fun. I thought this made a great fade. Um, and I happen to just have all these colors. I often just buy like one or two um, skeins of Jameson's of Shetland. Um, at a time. This is not in order. This one fell out of order over here. Um, and I'm like, oh, I'll just use that for a small thing. A great small thing is to do a faded yoke like this. So you can see it in the yoke from here. So I laid this out um, pretty, I mean, it wasn't like super painstaking to do it, but I was careful um, to make my own chart um, like in a notebook and do everything so it was even. So I either used two or three um, colors around, uh, no, excuse me. I used a color for either two or three rounds consecutively before switching. Um, so I used three of Cardinal, two of Paprika, three of Burnt Umber, two of Burnt Ochre, three of Autumn, and then back the other way, two Burnt Ochre, three Burnt Umber, two Paprika, three Cardinal. Um, came out nicely. I like, I like it. It's very subtle. It's autumnal. Um, and the shaping uh, is mostly done around the fern or the tree or whatever you want to call this. And I haven't blocked the yoke yet, so it's still a little messy, um, but not, not terrible. I'm not fussed. Um, so in that vein, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I constructed the yoke. So my first video, I talked about how we get the, you know, th first three pieces set up three individual pieces, the two sleeves and the body. In my second video, I showed you how you join those three onto the same needle. So in this video, it's mostly done. Whoops. Oh, I thought that was going to hit the ground really hard, but it was just the foam. <laughs> anyway, the third video, I'm, this one, I'm going to talk about how the whole thing is constructed. So from the yoke up. Okay. So the last time we spoke or I spoke to you, <laughs> um, I, I had just joined all of the needle or all the stitches on one needle. So I'm just gonna open this um, so that I can reference the pattern in case I forget. Okay, so I had done all of the, um, the joining and I the next thing I had to do was place raglan markers. So this sweater uh, pattern asks you, the designer asks you to 
um, instead of doing round decreases at the beginning of the yoke, when you're still pa uh, not patterning, you're just doing the in the, doing it on the main color, working in stockinette. Um, she asks you to place four raglan markers, or yeah, four total. Uh, in a normal pullover pattern, you'd have your end of row um, at uh, one of the raglan seams, but in my case, the end of row was in the middle of the steek, so I had to place four extra markers. Um, and you do some decreases on the raglans. You have to be careful with this pattern. Pay attention closely because in some of the rounds, you just, just decrease on the sleeve raglan points, like on the insides of the sleeves, and on some, you decrease at all the raglan points. Um, so you can kind of see a raglan seam here. It's hard to see with um, the dark yarn, which I like. And I will say that if I had knit this in light colored yarn, I don't know if I would have wanted the raglan effect. And I probably would have just waited until like knit straight up and then done a decrease round where I got to the number of stitches I needed to do my uh, yoke patterning and just done them circularly evenly around. Um, so that's one option too. So this is kind of a combination of a raglan uh, yoke and a round yoke with circular decreases. Circular yoke with what do you call it? Yeah, circular yoke with evenly de space decreases around because once you get to the patterning, you are doing uh, decreases just at um, points all along the sweater, um, back and front along those ferns or trees. So depends on the pattern you use. Well, this pattern has sort of rounded ones at the bottom, um, but in many traditional yokes, you'll also see more um, like pointed <laughs> trees or things that look more like. Uh, like uh, evergreen trees, I guess. Um, doesn't really matter. These are gorgeous. I love these ones. Um, and you'll notice if I show you the front, you'll see that I the steak is right in the middle of one of the flowers. So there, it's some, laid out symmetrically, the middle of the flower. Um, ah, dropped my notes, which are just on a sticky. Really professional today. <laughs> okay, uh, so yep, you do raglan decreases. Follow the instructions, be careful, um, unless you're comfortable making your own edits. And then when you're finished with the raglan decreases, you're gonna have the number of stitches that you need to have when you do the yoke patterning. But first you do the short rows. Um, and this was new to me. I usually do short rows either um, at the back of the neck, here at the top, or I do them like right after joining the body and the sleeves because, or sometimes like on the back before you join the body and the sleeves. Sometimes you can do them on all three if you want your back of your neck quite raised. Um, and the reason it's not, the, that's not the case here is because the yoke pattern doesn't start until you're like basically halfway done knitting the actual yoke, which is uh, for reference, a yoke is everything from here up, like where you join it and up to the neck. So in a lot of yoke sweaters, you're doing patterning on the entire yoke. So you have to do the short rows either right at the beginning or right uh, at the end or both, or before you join the body to the sleeves. Those are your options. So this is new. I liked it. It was great um, because if I had done it earlier, there would have been more stitches to accommodate with the short rows and the more stitches, the more cumbersome short rows uh, can be. And then if you do them at the back of the neck, like right after the patterning, you've got a whole sweater to be sloshing around like when you're turning the work to purl back. So, um, yep, that's that's how that works. And these are done with German, I mean, the instructions say to use German short rows. I always use German short rows, um, but use your favorite. You can do Japanese short rows, you can do wrap and turn, you can do German. There's probably other ones that I'm not aware of, but you should do a real short row technique um, so that you don't end up with holes. Um, mine has a few like little gap things, but I think they will close up with um, blocking. Yeah. So it's always a little murky until you block. Make sure you're also aware of that. It's important. Okay. Um, then I did the yoke pattern and then you just, uh, I, one thing that I will say, because I did it a car, uh, as a cardigan is that I cast off the steak when I finished the yoke patterning, did a couple of rows you can see here of brown, but then I cast off the steak and did the, um, ribbed band at the top back and forth. My ribbed band at the top is exactly half the length of my ribbed band at the bottom and uh, like the hem and the sleeves. So I did 20 rounds of ribbing on each cuff and hem. It's hard to see. Yeah, there you go. A couple of inches here, basically here to here. Um, and I did 10 at the top. Um, it's a little thick, 
but I think it'll be fine after blocking. It does fit me, um, which I'll show you after I um, after I we, uh, do the demo for the underarm seams. Um, I also want to note that this is already 15 minutes long, so I might separate this into two videos um, and like have me talking about it all in one video and then all the demo stuff in a different one, but maybe it doesn't matter. I don't know. Anyway, stay tuned. Uh, this next section may be in another video, maybe in the same video, depends on um, my, technically it depends on upload speeds. Uh, we have, as I've said before, we have satellite internet here, so it takes a while. Um, if the video is longer, it takes long, uh, like a really long time, and then sometimes it just like cancels, and it's like, nope, too much, too much to deal with. Um, so anyway, stay tuned, and I'm gonna switch the angle so you can see the um, demo on the underarm seams now, regardless of whether or not this is the end of the video. Okay, here is my quick demo on how to seam up your sleeves in a bottom up yoke style sweater. So I've got this long tail that I left on one of the sleeves um, when I broke the yarn. So my long tail is for grafting this um, together with Kitchener Stitch. Let's move my notes out of the way. Um, and I've got, you can see my sleeves here on hold. Um, and I need a needle for this because um, you have to put stitches on a needle to do Kitchener Stitch. So noting where my uh, side, the side that my yarn is hanging on, I wanna go in the other direction. So my needles uh, points end <laughs> at that spot. Um, okay, one, two, three, you're gonna to wanna to count. I'm gonna count at the end, so that's not too annoying. Um, but you do wanna count these stitches so that you make sure you have the same number. I think they're supposed to be 18. Total. Yeah, something like that. So you just pick them up from the waist yarn or the holder. This is probably really boring. You've probably done this before. Or if not, it's actually not a super hard thing to figure out. Ah, hello. Um, so I guess I'm just gonna. Sorry, I'm focusing. Otherwise, I would probably be blabbing about something. I guess I can talk about the weather. It's a terrible day here today. It's the middle of March. Um, great week though. Uh, stimulus check week for those of us who make under 80K, including me. And I also got my first COVID shot on Tuesday. Um, I feel great. My arm is a little bit sore still, but um, really excited about that. Gonna get back to normal one of these days. The reason, I, I don't actually know when I'm gonna upload this. Like now that, there's a lot of doses coming. Um, I feel like the rollout's gonna be pretty fast, um, but I'm getting my vaccine pretty early because I am a childcare provider. And um, I actually work where I live, obviously, but um, apparently they don't care about that. If you work in person and you're a childcare provider in Washington, DC, you can get vaccinated. And the kids do go to school, so, you know, but I feel kind of weird because I got the vaccine before their parents did and we all do live with the kids. Um, but yeah. Okay. So I'm going to kitchen of these together. Wait, I'm going to count two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Good. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Okay, great. So now I'm just going to kitchen or stitch these together. Um, and I'm going to tell you quickly, um, that there's a really good video on, um, dealing with the little holes that usually appear uh, both top down and bottom up sweaters can have this issue depending on how you pick up your stitches if you're doing it top down um, for your under underarms that you've put on hold. Um, but there's often these little these little holes at the sides of the well seam or picked up stitches or whatever. Um, there will definitely be one here. I always go and just close it up later because it's too messy to try and deal with it first. But um, Corinne from the Lily Thistle, who's the owner and designer behind their patterns and everything. She um, actually posted a video of how she seams up her, um, or closes up those little holes that's on YouTube. I will um, link to it in the show notes and it's super useful. She is really smart um, about little things like, like that. And uh, she's a really good shopcast. 
So if you have not watched that, you should really do, do yourself a favor. She's super entertaining and uh, she has amazing yarn that she sells. She makes you want to be her friend. <laughs> it's kind of what I always hope in my videos too. Um, ah, which is funny because you sit here and talk to yourself. It's not like you're talking to your friends. <laughs> Maybe it is. My friends could tell you if watching me talk to myself on my camera here is like talking to me in real life. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Now your guys are all probably like, please shut up. <laughs> this is really crinkly. Um, part of this yarn. I don't know if you can see how crinkly it is. Yeah, you can right there at the bottom. It gets really crinkly because, um, I forgot to unpick like the last nine stitches or something before putting all the stitches on hold. And um, I actually washed the first three pieces of the sweater um, before I joined them, as I probably mentioned in another video. Um, I washed them just to see how they would block. Um, the water came out pretty dirty because again, as I've said, the yarn on the cones is a little bit less processed. Um, so be aware of that. but. It's not a big deal. It smells more sheepy when it's wet. Um, but otherwise, I mean, personally, I have no problems with, you know, hay and stuff coming out in the water. And it's totally normal. It reminds you that this came off an animal, which it did. And yeah, I really, I think a lot. I like to think a lot about the sheep um, that, that we take wool from. They're just amazing. I think you think... If you don't know a lot about the properties of wool, it's a cool thing to learn about. You can get like fleece and fiber source books and guides um, that teach you more about different wool from different sheep and the breeds and stuff. But um, yeah, do yourself a favor and, and learn about it because it is, they're amazing animals. So I just realized right now that I did not um, make the, I brought the lamp over here and I didn't even turn the light on this work and it's basically black. <laughs> so um, that's fun. Although the more important um, thing you need this for is actually uh, for picking up button bands because picking up, like I can see the stitches on the needle. The needle is a different color than the wool. So the stitches contrast with the needle, but when you're picking up stitches for a button band and they all blend together and they're super dark brown, they can be really hard to see. So that's what the lamp is for here. And um, I also, as I've said, and I'll show you, I did a pearl bump at the edges of the steaks so that I would be able to see the stitches I'm supposed to pick up in a straight line. I'm going to pick up the stitch just outside of each pearl bump, um, just so that it's easier. Um, okay, that wasn't too long, seven minutes. <laughs> so then, probably not going to show a whole lot of this part, but you have to, basically, you have these... Um, I'm just gonna turn the lamp. Here we go. Okay. Maybe you can see I'm poking my hand through the hole that's left. <laughs> yeah, I suppose you can see that. Yeah. So I've got to close that up. And again, I'm gonna just direct you to watch Corinne's woolly thistle video on how to do that because she can explain it better than I can. And she has a darning mushroom in her video and like lighter colored yarn and it's just much easier to see. But thanks for sticking with me here. Uh, the next thing I think is going to be um, needle felting the steak, which is really fun. So, see you in a second. Okay, so now, next step, needle felted steak. So my underarms are done. Yeah, they're, they're not incredibly neat, but that's fine. I can fix them later if I need to. Um, they are closed, <laughs> so that's the main thing for now. Um, and the yarn is dark, so not a big deal. Okay, so got my felting pad here, got my very loud felting tool here, but first thing I actually am gonna do here is turn this baby inside out and cut the ends. So, again, you have to be a little bit careful here if you're gonna needle felt because you, don't, you do wanna make sure you're pulling all of them tightly here. I, again, like I said, I'm gonna knot some of these together. Um, because that won't get in the way. You know, you can trim it anyway. Just, it's it's for the felting, for purposes of felting. You just want to make sure that the stitches aren't going to come out and annoy you. <laughs> OK, 
All right, this one, just gonna pull tight. That seems fine. Most of them, you, you do wanna switch right in the middle of the steak. Um, a couple, I think I forgot to do that in one spot here. There, whoop, see some of these are kinda loose. That one, just, yeah, you just wanna make sure you're being careful. Knotting things together when you can. Um, let your color changes. It is fun to see um, some of the. Has something happened? Over, oh, that's what happened. I didn't. I didn't cut an end. Okay. Sorry, that was just me blabbering. Okay, I think they're all good. So now. It's so freeing not have to weave these in. Just cut them, trim them. You can trim them down even shorter after you've done the steak, or the, excuse me, secured the steak. Ooh, so exciting. At this point, I'm like, why do they even tie them into knots? Because now they're just gonna come undone, but fine. So be it. Cut them all. Oh, there's one down here, cut that one. So I've cut those out. Okay, now, gotta be careful with the needle felting pad. So you have to take this and actually put it inside the sweater so that you're felting directly against the pad and not felting the front of the sweater to the back of the sweater. That would be bad business. Okay, so there's my steak bridge, it's easy to see. Again, you can see here, there's the pearl, pearl bridge bridges there around the steak so that when I'm going down here securing the steak, um, I, oh, that doesn't go in the back. I am aware of where I need to do the needle felting because this is dark yarn. Wouldn't be totally sure otherwise. Okay, so my felting tool's inside here. I am gonna have to move it down gradually as I go. Here's my felting tool. It's got three needles on it, which is ideal. Uh, three to five would be good. Um, one is fine, it just takes longer. And so basically you just go at it. You tack it with, this tool between these two pearl bumps. Um, I like go at it pretty hard, quite a lot. Um, I try to go systematically across and down, then I go over other parts of it. If you accidentally go across, like over here, it's fine. Um, it's not gonna look crazy on this, like on the front side, unless you go like quite a lot. Um, it's just gonna be kind of felted over on the back side, which is fine. I've thought about thinking like, what if you did that like lightly all over the places where your um, like long floats were in there? Um, but I don't know if I'd wanna risk that. Okay. Cause you can, sometimes you can pull pieces up through and it doesn't look great. So you really do just wanna try and keep the needle felting to inside the steak area. Okay, so now I'm gonna take this, peel this away and you can see the inside, you can see the inside. I'm gonna take the, take the foam pad out. So it's gonna get in the way otherwise. And oops, there goes the felting tool. There you can see it's all fuzzy. That is not gonna come out, very secure. Um, so I think that's probably enough. It's going to take a, quite a bit of time to do the whole thing. So I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to keep you, but short demonstration. Uh, if you have any other questions, send me a note, comment, email, whatever, um, barnabynits at gmail.com. Um, and this, like, for instance, does this work with any yarn? No, it doesn't. Don't do this with superwash yarn. If you're going to use superwash yarn, you should crochet, um, your edges to reinforce them because machine um, sewing machines can slip up. Um, Superwash yarn is really slippery. You don't even have to secure a steak with a uh, Shetland wool, but I do. I always do a needle felted steak just to be sure. I don't 100% trust myself. I can be um, a little rough with my uh, sweaters sometimes. I'm trying to be careful with my hand knits, but um, but yeah, I just I don't want to like accidentally pull on something and have it unravel. Um, it's like my worst nightmare. So, yep, this is great for any kinds of sticky yarns. Um, even like non-superwash worsted spun yarn, this works there too. So, um, yeah, definitely consider needle felting your steak. And uh, look at this little happy little stomach. Yeah, it's a happy stomach over here. So cute. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, that's all for now. Um, the next installment of this is going to be how to pick up a button band. So enjoy that and see you uh, in a second. Okay, so last installment here before I suppose at the end I'll record something. Uh, when I say the end, I mean like in, in several days I will record it, but I'll put it at the end of this video um, of me showing you the finished sweater wearing it. Because um, I'm going to do the button bands, uh, cut it open, block it, and then sew the buttons on, and then you'll see. Okay, so with button bands, um, women, in a women's uh, sweater, the buttons will be on the left and the button holes will be on the right. And so the button holes take a lot more focus than the button bands and more planning because uh, button hole side, so the right side, that takes more planning because you have to decide where you're gonna put the button holes. Um, so I sometimes do that first, I'll like put this thing on and I'll mark with the little uh, in interlocking stitch markers where I'm gonna do that. Um, but for the purposes of right now, I'm gonna do the right side first and then do the, uh, or excuse me, the left side first, where I'm eventually gonna sew the buttons on, and then I'll do the uh, right side and decide before I um, before I start it how I wanna put the buttons on. Maybe I'll do a video of me cutting up the front of the steak. Yeah, maybe I'll do that. Um, but it's always fun, fun to capture on video. Okay, so picking up stitches along the side of um, something for like neckband, button band, that kind of thing. Um, the general rule is you wanna pick up every three out of every four stitches. So when you're picking up along a neckline, there's often actually some stitches that are just sitting there on hold. You obviously wanna pick up all of those live stitches um, and knit them. But when you're doing the, um, the button band, you don't want it to be too saggy and bulky, so you only wanna do three out of four. Um, however, I tend to pick up as many as I can, um, like one per ridge or round or whatever along the actual edge because otherwise that can get, um, you don't want that to be pulled too tight because it'll look awkward. So I'm going to do like eight or eight or nine, let's see, uh, along the edge. And you do want to make somewhat careful notes on this um, because you're going to have to do two of them. So one, two, um, Three, it's gonna plunk around, sorry. Four, five, six, seven. Come on, you. Eight, nine, and I guess we'll do ten. 10, that's good, and then um, and then three out of every four. Um, I should also say, uh, if you are unfamiliar with a good way to pick up stitches, you're looking for a good way to pick up stitches, also you probably can't see this that well. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. Um, I don't have like super fancy uh, camera stuff so I can position it behind me. I guess I could try that sometime. Um, but anyway, for now, this is it. Uh, again, the the Wooly Thistle has a great video um, on like how to show where you see really up close like what part of the stitch you're supposed to knit through. Um, you are actually just supposed to pick up, let's see if I can zoom this in, can I zoom in? Come on, really? No? Okay. I guess you can zoom in before you start filming, but here I'll just hold it up. Um, so there's like the two V's of a stitch that are just lying there. You want to go through both of those V's. That's basically the rule. Knit through it. There you go. You only need one needle for this. So there's one, two, ah, two, and then three. Be the first fawn colored one. And then I'm gonna skip one. So you're knitting three out of every four. Skip that, and you're again doing this right on the side of the steak. Sorry for the second needle clanking around here. Let's just stick that in there. One, right now it's really easy to see because they're all light colored. One, two, oh, shut up. Three, do you talk to inanimate objects or are you normal? No, everyone talks to inanimate objects. Are you weird? <laughs> if you don't talk to inanimate objects, you're weird. One, two, three, skip. One, 
to ah, three, skip one, two, three, skip one. trickier because it's going to be all black. Three. Skip. Okay, this is going to be really boring if I just keep doing this on camera and it's going to be annoying because this thing is just banging around everywhere. I'm going to do the rest um, and maybe show you at the end what it looks like. Turn the camera back on. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so you knit, you, you're going to want to pick up and knit all of these stitches. Again, make a note of how many you have and make the same number when you do the other button band. <laughs> um, it shouldn't be super hard if you're careful about stitches, which stitches you're picking up. Um, after you do your first row, you're gonna wanna work in a one by one rib oh, or whatever whatever floats your boat. I'm gonna do a one by one rib. Some people do like an I-cord bind off, that's cool. Um, you could attach like some cool clasps to the front if you did an I-cord bind off. But because my hems and my cups and my like neckline here are all one by one rib, I want my button bands to match. So that's why I'm doing it that way. Um, so stay tuned. I'll turn this back on when I'm casting off. Oh, and you should do, let's see. So you always pick up on the right side, like on a right side row. So you're going to want to do, an, you're going to want to do, I don't know, maybe 10 total, eight total, however, however thick you want your button band. Do your last full knit row or, you know, worked row on a wrong side and then cast off on the right side. So that'll mean I'm going to do an odd number of rows total, probably just seven rows back and forth. And then on the eighth row, I'll cast off, which will be the right side. So this doesn't count. This is a setup row because I'm picking up stitches. Okay. I think that's all. Um, thanks for tuning in. I'll be back.